Good morning. I'm Gene Johnson, your elder on call this week. Our care caregivers for this week are Helen Maxwell and Kristen Bowers. If you or anyone you know uh, has a need for caregiving this week, a meal, a phone call, uh, please give uh, one of the caregivers or me a call and we'll be glad to help in whatever way we can. We want to extend a warm welcome to everyone worshiping with us today, especially any guests. It's an honor to be with you. We're delighted that you can join us today. Um, we have uh, a few announcements. Um, on this Trinity Sunday, the Justice and Peace Committee asked us to wear orange today. Uh, this is the announcement from, from orange.org. Even in a pandemic, we are reminded of the devastating toll gun violence takes on communities and the myriad, myriad of ways that racism and white supremacy put black people and people of color in an increased risk of gun violence. In honor of Hadea Pendleton and all survivors of gun violence, we come together to take a stand against the deadly mix of white supremacy racism and gun violence in this country. Stand with us in the fight against the injustice by wearing orange for National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Um, a couple of other reminders. Uh, the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper will be celebrated today. Uh, please prepare a table before you at home as we can share a common loaf and cup. Um, reminded that we'll have the Celebrations and Concerns Zoom meeting at uh, 2 p.m. A session is going to have a called meeting at 3 to discern how we can proclaim the world that Black Lives Matter. Uh, we also want to thank everyone for their continued financial support. Remind you that there's um, online ways of, of making your pledge. Uh, you can, of course, sign up for direct deposit and the good old U.S. mail. Uh, you can just send your check. Uh, we have a couple of other announcements. Um, first, from Sharon Andrews. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, um, I have a message from Landon Structures and I'm gonna just read it. I wanted to let you know what's been going on on the church property. And you might know that the Chapel Hill preschool is moved out and a new pre preschool called Blossom is moving in and Chris Lutz has worked with them to get them moved in and settled and a new floor is being put in. Uh, we've made some minor repairs around the property to gutters and um, siding and did some tree trimming and all things that people from the congregation helped us with and we're very thankful for that. Um, the community, oh, and if anyone wants to participate in that effort, please contact me, including mowing. We have um, sort of reduced our mowing um, area in order to um, create some more um, welcoming places for birds and bees, and it cuts down our work. And you can contact me or Chris Lutz if you're interested in helping with that. The community garden is up and running. We have um, several people helping us and participating in the garden, Marty and I, and um, a couple of residents from Elliott Woods and a woman who just wandered in from Old Oxford Road. Um, and so we have, <laughs> we have a nice little group going. And what I wanna share with you next is a little video we made of the garden. And you'll see John Rupp working along the side of the sanctuary um, redoing a garden that was once there and got kind of overgrown. And you'll see a beautiful sign that Lori Brokenbra made for us. Okay, Karen, hit it.
Sorry. Um, I'll post it on the announcements too. It didn't show the whole film. So Julie Byerly, our um, clerk of session, will give us the session highlights. Thanks so much. Even if it didn't show the whole film, it was beautiful and it's so good to see our church property. Um, the session meeting in May focused on transition and the transition team has been working hard on getting the roles correct for the church and uh, that work um, will involve a lot of follow-up. Also, um, the session transition team, sorry, not the session transition team, but the transition team is um, anticipating uh, cottage meetings and each person will be invited to each of three cottage meetings to talk about our past, present, and the future of our church and look forward to more information coming out um, about those meetings uh, soon. Those are likely to start in July and will probably have to be by Zoom, unfortunately. Also, with regard to session work on transition, this past week, Julie, myself, G, Jean, and Sue um, met with the Commission on Ministry to ensure that we were appropriately on track for transition. And we specifically discussed the importance of the separation ethics expectations, and we made sure that we were doing all that we can to prepare the church for the next installed pastor. And you'll be hearing more about that along the way but the Commission on Ministry um, representatives were very helpful to us as we reassessed our progress. Um, the other issue that and as Sharon pointed out, we, um, we are uh, wanting so badly to get back um, where we can see each other face to face, but we believe it is in the best interest of each of us to um, refrain from meeting an official church business face to face unless physical presence is required. And if physical presence on the church grounds is required, we ask that everyone comply with CDC recommendations, which includes wearing masks, um, maintaining six feet physical distance and using um, hand washing resources frequently. Um, and even though that's painful for all of us, we really want to keep our community safe and we're proud of the work that we have done um, so far to that end. Jean mentioned a bit about our finances. I'll just point out that thanks to the Blossoms rental of the preschool, we're in better financial shape than we anticipated and we're pleased with that. Um, we also have another tenant, another preschool tenant interested in renting the education building and um, we have an attorney helping us to get permission from the city to do that, the town of Chapel Hill. So um, we're excited about uh, how things are going in the work of the church, but we recognize that this is an incredibly challenging time and, this, and we miss you individually. Um, we're grateful for our virtual community and um, more detailed announcements will be in the email from session highlights. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Let us worship God.
Please join me in the call to worship. Mysterious God, power behind all we see, grace beyond all we know, love before all we meet. We cannot comprehend your majesty. We only know your presence in our lives. You who knew us before we were born, you who will cradle us after our last breath. We cannot encompass your glory. Instead, we marvel at all the works your hand has made, and we worship and adore you. Welcome again to the Church of Reconciliation on this Trinity Sunday. God's call to worship also serves as a call to confession. Let us welcome the Spirit's movement in us and through us as we pray this morning's prayer of confession. It seems too good to be true, O oh God, that you would care for mere mortals like us. In our messy lives, often caught up in trivialities, that you would mold us in your own image, social creatures with a divine spark. So good, we'd rather not believe, rather not see your image in those around us, crying out for love and companionship. Rather not see your wisdom underpinning creation, groaning at our wanton waste and exploitation. God, above all, help us with our unbelief, our incredulity, our self-preserving acts which isolate and harm. Pour mercy into our hearts and souls, giving us eyes to see and ears to hear your gift in every person, every place, every moment. For your greatness is seen in all the world. May our words and actions be our praise of you. Reaching up, and out into your kingdom made real for us in the person of Jesus. Amen. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Hear now and believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Hi, I have some invitations that needed to go out and um, you didn't come pick them up. Now, how are people supposed to know about my party if I don't get the invitations out? Sorry, I was busy. Um, but how are people going to know about my party? Well, maybe they can hear about it on the book face or whatever it's called. Uh. Hey, it's Becky from the post office. Hey, Becky, it's Karen again. I called you about my invitations, but today I'm having a little bit of trouble because I have some bills that need to be paid and you have not come to pick them up. Oh, that's my bad. It was raining and I straightened my hair this morning and you know how it is. Like, you can't mess up your hair. So I just didn't. Ugh. <sighs> Becky from the post office. Hey, Becky, it's Karen Miller again. I'm having a little trouble with my mail. Um, I haven't been getting my birthday cards, and my Nana usually sends me like a dollar for every year old I am, and I'm getting to the real good money now, and um, I just have not gotten my birthday cards yet. Do you know where they are? Oh, I got bored, so I opened them, and I saw the money, and so I took it. No. Oh. Yeah, I know that's like fraud, but I really needed it so I could get my nails done. They're looking really bad right now. Oh, okay. Becky from the post office. Hey, Becky. Karen Miller again. Sorry to call for the fourth time, but um, I was just like going through my stacks of mail, and I haven't gotten any like junk mail in a while, and I... I'm really wondering what kind of specials Mosquito Joe has going on. Um, there's lots of things I might be missing out on. Do you know where my junk mail is? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. We meant to get that to you. It's, we're going to get it there as soon as possible. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Thanks, Becky. <sighs> Thank goodness the post office isn't like this. Even during the past few months, when things have been crazy, the post office has been working hard to get our mail to us. They never stop, and I'm sure you've probably heard part of their slogan that says, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from swift completion of their appointed rounds. Now, I said the word courier there. Might be a new word for you, but that means that they send or carry from one place to another. Delivering the mail, they send it, they deliver it. Now the scripture today says that Jesus gave us the job of a courier. Maybe you didn't know that. We don't get to wear a postal worker uniform, but it's pretty important. It's called the Great Commission, and it sounds pretty fancy, doesn't it? The Great Commission means that we are to go out and share the good news of God's love. We're also couriers because we're supposed to send that news and that love and share it with others. Now, we're dealing with some sad times, and a lot of it is pretty difficult to understand or know how that we can be helpers. The Great Commission is the reminder we need right now that the most important thing that we can be doing is sharing God's love and living out what Jesus taught us. Caring for the sick, standing with those who are forgotten, loving our neighbor, and fighting for justice. Always sending and delivering without fail. That's what we're taught, and that's what we can do. Would you please pray with me? Jesus, as we search for the ways we can be helpers in the world, thank you for reminding us that we are called to be couriers of your love and share it with others. And all God's children said, Amen.
please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy One, three in one, in the beginning you said, let there be light, and there was light. By this light, help us see your glory as it is revealed in Christ, to whom all scripture bears witness, with whom the Holy Spirit leads. Amen. Our scripture today is Psalm 8, verses 1 through 9. O God, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avengers. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortars, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O God, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Church in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When was the last time that there was a baptism at the Church of Reconciliation? And Jeanette Thomas assures me that the next time will be when she brings Arlo to the font that usually stands in front of this table. I love baptisms, even and perhaps especially when everything goes awry, because nothing that happens during a baptism, from a baby's crying to the parents forgetting their baptismal vows, discourages a church from laughing and loving as Christ commands us to laugh and love. A baptism, in my experience, is one of those moments in congregational life in which the whole congregation bubbles with cheer. Thus, I wonder why more churches are not more intentional about welcoming children into the community. In today's gospel reading, Jesus says, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, 
even to the end of the age. When I read Jesus' last words in Matthew's Gospel, I wonder if American churches are any better at disciple-making than we are at welcoming the unbaptized to church. Has the great commission become the great omission in American faith and life? Statistics suggest that it has. According to the Pew Research Forum, one of the fastest growing demographics in American religious studies is spiritual, not religious. In 2018, one in six Christians left the church with most preferring to remain unaffiliated. Among Protestants, evangelical mainline and historically black churches, can you guess which community is fading the fastest? The one that looks back at us when we are brave enough and humble enough to look in a mirror. Be not despondent because in an age of COVID-19, economic distress and social upheaval, hope is the cleanest burning fuel that we have to propel us in the direction of God's dream. Church, synagogue, and mosque attendance typically rises when feelings of helplessness become widespread. Every reminder that we are not God serves us serves as a call to worship the one or three in one who is. Why isn't the church more deliberate about sharing the gospel of God's love with other people? Is it because we believe that all we have to do is show up at church and the Holy Spirit will send the next generation to us? Perhaps it will. Or perhaps it will lead us toward the next generation if we are willing to change, if we are willing to be transformed. Has the church become so afraid of being perceived as proselytizing that we never pro proclaim the gospel? Or have spiritual experiences in the church become so superficial, so facile that the church is nothing to say in a culture that is increasingly spiritual and less religious. Maybe we believe that baptism is enough, that belonging to a community is all that's necessary for any of God's children to feel validated and loved. Maybe it is. But what if it's not? And I ask this question as Americans demonstrate in the streets amid a global pandemic. I pray that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we do not refuse to make disciples because we confuse disciple making with indoctrination. Before Jesus commissions his disciples to make disciples in Matthew, he summarizes the gospel that he would have us proclaim by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, Christ explains, hang all the law and the prophets. Why would anybody be ashamed to share such amazing grace and love? Wouldn't the world be better off if we loved our neighbors as Christ teaches us to love? At this point in Jesus' life, the Hebrew scriptures are the only Bible that he knows. And today, these same texts are regarded as sacred by over 4.3 billion Christians, Muslims, and Jews who comprise over half of the world's population. I shudder every time I hear someone dismiss the Hebrew scriptures or Christian Old Testament as irrelevant or angry. The stories that are told in the Old Testament repeatedly bear witness to God's mercy and love. And of course, if you're into proof texting, these stories are rich enough to twist into any point that you wish to make about ancient Israel's religious practices. Please note that scripture's greatest poetry collection appears in the Old Testament, not the New. 
How beautiful is this morning psalm in which the psalmist asks, what are human beings that God is mindful of them? Who are we mortals that God cares for us? Ages before Martin Luther King Jr. marched on Washington or Gandhi marched to the sea, Moses led an oppressed people out of Egypt in search of freedom from a wilderness not of their own making. Since the social justice that Jesus preaches and practices comes from a biblical tradition that is shared among world's religions, I wonder what life on earth would be like if all of Abraham's descendants became as audacious as Moses and his people are in the face of systemic cruelty. Black lives matter. They matter to God. They matter to us. And to all who share our common calling in Christ, our common heritage in Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, and our shared experiences as human beings. Preaching this Sunday, given all that is happening, is challenging. Trust that the retired clergy in this congregation would attest to that. As a minister of word and sacrament, I am charged to proclaim the gospel of God's love and Jesus Christ. And on this Trinity Sunday, the church encourages us to reflect on the extent to which this love is revealed in each person of the Trinity, the one through whom all life is set in motion, and then redeemed and sustained by mercy and love. After agonizing a bit over what to say this morning, at last I had an aha moment regarding how the events of the past week relate to where we are in the liturgical year. Baptism, disciple making, and God's promises of justice and peace foster hope. They foster hope in communities where life might otherwise be hopeless. We visited and revisited the subject of the Trinity during Easter. Remember when Jesus declares in John's Gospel, I am in the Father and the Father is in me? In this statement, Christ himself dabbles in Trinitarian theology. Though the word Trinity appears nowhere in Scripture. Classic interpretations of the relationships among the persons of the Trinity remind us that spiritual intimacy doesn't require one person in a relationship to surrender one's sense of self for the sake of the union. In fact, the distinctiveness of each person in a relationship strengthens the bond and heightens the experience and expression of holy love. Before Jesus ascends in John, he promises his disciples that the Holy Spirit will come to abide with them. In Matthew, he assures them that the Spirit will be with them always, even to the end of the age. What gives me hope as I watch American society unravel and implode are moments of solidarity in the streets. Like when police officers kneel out of respect for George Floyd, and when a broken hearted nation worships together in celebration of Floyd's life, and in our outrage over the injustice perpetrated against him. As a Gen Xer who is well acquainted with the next generation, I raised one and taught others, I must confess that. The potential of this group of leaders serves as a source of hope for me. However, the kindness and compassion of the next generation does not absolve any of us old geezers, to quote Wes Hare, of our responsibility to do something now. Sometimes I fear that the church which all too often lives in the past, offers less to the next generation than the next generation offers to us. Recognizing that one person never speaks for an entire generation, 
I apologize to the next generation for the failings of mine. We have not always been the church that this society and you need us to be. We have not loved one another as we love ourselves. And if you happen to be African-American, I lament that we have not dismantled the system that encourages white on black crimes so that if you are or become a parent, you may rest assured that your children will be able to breathe. But hear me say this, we are not giving up. This week, I heard an African-American minister say that he appreciated the fact that white colleagues were reaching out to him. Then he explained that when other ministers, white ministers, asked him what they could do, he replied, you created this problem, now you expect us to fix it? Racism is our problem. And until we learn to love one another, Social divides will deepen and violence will persist and intensify. The church at its best models a just and loving society. At our worst, the church serves as an echo chamber where like-minded people gather to confess the sins of their neighbors rather than their own. As a church and as a nation, we have sins to confess. I pray that we will look in the mirror and see how we have failed to love one another. And I hope that we will repent and start over with the assurance that we are loved. Relationships are breaking and are broken. And yet these relationships may be restored as we go and make disciples and baptize one another with the tenacity and endurance of triune love. To the blessed and only sovereign, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, the honor and eternal dominion, Amen.
are living in a time where thoughts and prayers are considered non-action. It's used as an easy way to calm down that voice inside us that knows we should be acting. It looks like those that we care about when they hear these words, it's to show that we care, but the words are often just empty. Let us lift up our prayers this morning knowing that they are words, words that demand action and care. Jesus taught us to pray, but he also taught us that we have to be ready to do the work. We have to walk with those who hurt, stand with those fighting the hard fight, work to help the hungry, the poor, the defenseless, the sick, the persecuted, the unloved, and the voiceless, even if it's hard. As we lift up our prayers today, help us remember that these words demand our love and attention. You can please text any celebrations and concerns to Courtney Chavez. You can check the chat for the number. The Reconciliation Peace Community asks that you join them in praying for the following concerning gun violence. The United States, with less than 5% of the world's population, has 46% of the world's civilian-owned guns, easily ranking number one in firearms per capita. The United States also has the highest homicide by firearm rate among the world's most developed nations. Some 40,000 Americans die from guns every year. That's more than 100 people dying from guns every day. On average, far more American civilians die from guns on our own streets than the number of American servicemen and women who die in foreign wars during that same period. In spite of these very sad statistics, currently there are no federal laws banning semi-automatic assault weapons, military style caliber rifles, handguns, or large capacity magazines. There was a federal, pro federal prohibition on assault weapons and large capacity magazines in the 10 years between 1994 and 2004, but Congress allowed these restrictions to expire. And in the following 16 years, there's been no success in reinstate, reinstating this prohibition. Please join the Reconciliation Peace Community in praying and acting to persuade supposedly exceptional United States to join the huge majority of other civilized nations regarding gun control. Prayers for Anne Jeanette and her family. She was back in the hospital this week, but we rejoice that she is once again at home with her kids. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Doris Tippins is grateful for all the prayers and concerns for David Gould, a former member here at the REC. His surgeon reported that his last scan showed no tumor in the brain. He and Suzanne are happy and grateful and continued prayers needed for issues around his continued double vision. A friend of Bennett and Alice Myers has finished treatment for a cerebellar tumor and is ready for immunotherapy for the primary tumor in her lungs. She is active around Solterra, which may be a helpful indication of the immunotherapy. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ken Jens had surgery on Friday. He's still hospitalized and hopes to go home on today. Both he and Sandy appreciate the church's outpouring of love. And for the Peace and Justice Committee, tomorrow, Monday, June 8th at 9 a.m., Elizabeth McAllister, 80 years old, will be sentenced from her home in Connecticut by video conferencing with Judge Lisa Godby Wood in the Southern District of Georgia Federal Court in Brunswick for her nonviolent disarmament action against the Kings Bay Trident Base in Georgia. More than two years ago, Liz and her six Catholic resistors, including Rex friend, the Rex friend Patrick O'Neill, entered onto the U.S. Navy Naval Submarine Base in St. Mary, Georgia to beat swords into plowshares. It is significant that they chose to take this courageous action on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. to denounce the existence and threat of Trident submarines based at Kings Bay and their link to racism. Borrowing from Dr. King, we pray for Liz and her family and all the people of our nation and world acting to abolish weapons and racism. O oh God of the world, faith in you makes it possible to meet disappointment and sorrow with an inner poise, 
and to absorb the most intense pain without abandoning our sorrow and our sense of abandoning our sense of hope for we know as Paul testified in life and death in Chapel Hill or New York or in Brunswick, Georgia, that all things work together for good to them that love you and them who are called according to your purpose. God in your mercy. From Craig and Sandy Debussy. When I first saw the statue of Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia, I assumed it had stood since the Civil War. In fact, it was erected 25 years after the war as a part of campaign by white segregationists across the South in an effort to tell a romanticized version of the war, known as the Lost Cause, and promote white supremacy. I also wondered how long the statue would stand. This week, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, who is making his own journey of redemption with African Americans, announced the statue will be removed and placed in storage. In his speech, Northam gave his reasons for ordering the removal of this statue. I invite you to find and listen to a speech by Mitch Landrieu, former mayor of New Orleans, who oversaw, oversaw the removal of Confederate statues in that city in 2017, for a powerful statement on why these monuments need to come down. We celebrate the decisions by Governor Northam and Richmond Mayor LaVar Stoney to remove the city's Confederate monuments as a hopeful act in a week in a week when we can all use more hope. As Landrieu said at the time, the big message we should hear from the streets of Baltimore and Ferguson and Charlottesville and New Orleans is that we are not done. We have more work to do. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sandy Debussy writes, last week Craig and I celebrated another year in our amazing adventure together. It's been 38 years since we said, I do, and I'm so glad that we did. I can't imagine life without the company of this creative and big-hearted man. And Lutz writes, Sarah is going to an anti-police violence and anti-racism protest in Greensboro this afternoon and said, I may get tear gassed. I'm simultaneously proud of her and anxious for her safety even as I acknowledge my privilege that I can be anxious for her safety for an afternoon and not 24 seven. Prayers for all on the front lines of this important work. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Carolyn Eikenberry writes, I recently got a call from Pat Eccles, sister of Curtis Harper, who lives in Auburn, Alabama. We had a wonderful conversation, remembering Curtis and his life of service. She asked me to tell our congregation that her family will always be grateful for the loving care we gave Curtis in his later years, as well as the home he experienced here. Beth Bale asks us to please pray for M. Thomas, that's her mom, who has been in the ED yesterday and again today for fluids. With her blood disorder, her doctor said an infection will kill her. She was told in the ED that she has a UTI and colitis, and she is on antibiotics. So we need to hold her in our care. Chris Lutz writes, I give thanks for those in the president's party who are acting and speaking out to try to curb his worst instincts, military leaders, elected officials, government workers, and ordinary citizens. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please keep my co-workers, Teresa and Deb, in your prayers as they go through surgery this, this week. That's from Pam Rivers. And Pam also writes, celebrations to Ron for your powerful sermon today. Sharon Andrews asks for prayers for her oldest friend, Mary Liz. Her son continues treatment for myeloma and related heart problems. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit, that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love. 
Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, we, we pray for the world. We pray, God, our creator, you made all things in your wisdom and in your love, you save us. We pray for the whole creation. Overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong. Feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made and joyfully sing your praises. We pray for the church. Gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us in faith, one in faith in service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world that all may believe you are love. Turn to your ways and live in the light of your truth. We pray for peace, eternal God. You sent us a savior, Christ Jesus, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn nation against nation and race against race. Speed the day when wars will end and the whole world accepts your rule. We pray for leaders. Give vision to all who serve and lead, that with goodwill and justice, they may take down barriers and draw one new world in peace. We pray for the sick. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick. Cheer them by your word and bring healing as a sign of your grace. We pray for those who sorrow. God of comfort, stand with those who sorrow, that they may be sure that neither life nor death, nor things present nor things to come shall separate them from your love. We pray for those who join Habakkuk and pray the words, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save. God of justice, unite us in love for our neighbors. Bring about an end to racism that plagues our communities. Strengthen those who mourn in anguish over the deaths of black and brown bodies. Walk beside those who live with a fear that most of us will never know. Sit beside those who live in grief, especially the families of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor. Stir our hearts that we might act in solidarity with our neighbors of color and join your mission to establish your peaceable kingdom and earth as it is in heaven. Mighty God, whose word we trust, whose spirit enables us to pray, accept our requests and further those which bring about your purpose for the earth. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Holy God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us away from temptation and deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. God gathers us from north and south, east and west, to sit at this table. Though this congregation is scattered, we are one body. And the invitation to share in this feast comes not from the Church of Reconciliation or, or New Hope Presbytery, the Peace of USA. It comes from God in Jesus Christ, whose spirit is still with us. So let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy, holy, holy God, blessed three in one. You created the cosmos and called it good. Your word became flesh and gave us new life. You made us a church by the power of your spirit, and you sustain us still. You call us to righteousness, challenge us with your justice, and overwhelm us with your love. Bless now the gifts of bread and wine, fruits of your good earth, body and blood of Christ, our communion with you and one another. 
conform our wills to your will. Open our minds and enlarge our hearts. Renew our hope and strengthen us in faith until we feast together at your table in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. On the road to Emmaus, after Jesus was resurrected, he met Cleopas and another disciple who did not recognize him at first. As they moved toward Emmaus, they spoke of faith and life, of forgiveness and freedom. Cleopas and the other disciple did not know it was the risen Christ with whom they traveled. We travel with Jesus this morning, remembering that in the breaking of bread, is the recognition of God's majesty. And so these gifts of God are for you and me, the people of God, as we take from this loaf and drink from this cup. As we hear the music, you are invited to take this bread and to share this cup as we proclaim Christ's coming until he comes again. to go to the upper right corner of your screen, click gallery view, so that you can sing and wave and rejoice with one another in the faith that God has given us.
thanks to Julie Byerly for this month's session highlights, Gene Johnson for serving as elder on call, Dale Herman for making music with us, Courtney Chavez for singing and leading us in prayer, and Karen Miller for reminding us every Sunday that we're all God's children, regardless of our age. Now hear and receive the blessing and charge that comes from Scripture. As God's own, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and patience, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. And crown all these things with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now to the one who is able to keep us from falling and to make us stand without shame in the presence of God's glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Alleluia. Um. Amen. Uh -huh. Hi, everybody. Hello. See Sophie. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hi, Sophie. Hi there. Good morning, Hello. Karen. Hi, Dylan, Sharon. Hi. Hi, Doris. Good to see y'all. Good, Good to, to see hear you. you. Good to see you too. Yeah. Why doesn't everybody unmute? <laughs> Some people didn't get unmuted. How are you, Babby? They have to unmute themselves. Yes, they do. You need to unmute yourself if you can't hear us. Yeah, a lot of people hear them. Hello. Oh, Craig, the beauty of Sandy. Oh, good. She's going to play that garden video. Okay, good. So I think you have to go to speaker view. Is that right? Thank you. Hopefully you can see all Just for the show. <laughs> yeah. was the in terms of the buffet you're creating for his, I think so. His, uh, yeah, consumption. Right. When he no brings offense, his extended I think the family, the groundhog is my favorite part problem. of worship today. What's that? I said no offense, but I think the groundhog might have been my favorite part of worship today. <laughs> That's yeah. so great. But Chris says they're calling the groundhog fatty. 
Oh, no. Chubby, he said. Maybe chubby. Fatty. Maybe chunky. I thought that was John Rowe. <laughs> <laughs> chunky. Yeah. Wait a minute. John Rupp gave us exclusive rights to allow for a cameo appearance at no charge. So we have to be thankful for that. I'm very grateful. Hi, funny. everyone. Hi. What's that? Don't everybody speak at once. Can anybody hear me? This is Shirley. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, oh, you I couldn't could unmute have... yourself. Well, I, 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 yes. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon gets the joke. She tried to teach me how to use my computer so I could come to church. Anyway, um, anyway I'm glad you can hear me because... I want to say how nice it is to be able to see all your faces. Amen. Uh, the groundhog, I'm, I'm more iffy about the groundhog, but I'll <laughs> be real clear about all of you. I love it's going to fade for the groundhog. Who's on the phone? That was Mary Lee was on the phone. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not on the phone. I'm not on the phone. She's innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? Desiree and Kay Roberts. Oh, Desiree and Kay Roberts. Oh, hey. Hey. hey there. Hello. Hi, there we are. Now we can people. Mm -hmm. How is life in Raleigh? Wilcox. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Oh, the beauty's unmuted. Hello, Greg. Alan, how are you feeling? Good, thank you. Good to hear. Good to see your smiling face, both of you. Who are you talking to? Where are you?